welcome to The Random Show. This is episode 74. I am Tim Ferriss. And I'm Kevin Rose. Uh, we are in San Francisco, California. We are. Uh, cheers to you, my friend. Cheers. It's been a while. We haven't done a show in a few weeks. Yeah. We actually got better at doing shows. We have. We have. I feel like we're, we're synchronizing our menstrual cycles or something. That's right. <laughs> uh, <laughs> Yeah, it's been, uh, we did that live one that didn't work out so well because the uh, the stream was not good and we didn't have someone like Graham behind the camera. That's true. So it was funny, like we got drunk, we did that show. <laughs> I thought we were having a good time and well, then I we went back and watched time. it it looked like an 8-bit video <laughs> game. It was like shitty audio, it was all blocky, it was, it was not good. So this is in uh, beautiful HD, um, yeah. thanks to Graham. Thank you, sir. And. Uh, so what have we learned recently? We did, uh, we had a bit of a cranial competition before we started filming because Kevin was sure that his head was larger than mine. And it uh, turns out we both have almost exactly same circumference on our uh, bridge troll foreheads, which is 23 and a half inches, which happens to be the same circumference as Daria's waist. And the same size as my <laughs> No, I'm just kidding. And there we uh, go. This is this. <laughs> This show is off to a great I've start. Had, this is my third drink, so <laughs> I'm allowed to say penis when I've had three drinks. Bone marrow, shall we endorse bone marrow? Bone marrow, yes. Yeah, speaking uh, of... Uh, Saint, uh, I always want to call it St. Francis, but that's not it. St. Vincent. Because I want to thank yes. you. Yes. So we just went and had an amazing dinner. Mm -hmm. um, if you are ever out visiting San Francisco or you live in San Francisco, do check out a place in the mission called St. Vincent. Um, phenomenal food. We had pulled pork. We had bone marrow, which it sounds disgusting if you've never had it, but it's actually like butter, tasty, oily, amazing spread for bread. Um, I, it, it sounds so pretentious to talk about bone marrow. Oh, we got bone marrow tonight. But it's like it's like 10 bucks and it's freaking phenomenal. We could make it even more pretentious by saying that the wine selection is incredibly impressive. Uh, the the smelling has done a great job, but it's, it's a very small restaurant, extremely cozy. Mm -hmm. uh, I find that, to me at least, going out the ambiance of Right. It's not even the ambiance, like the density of sort of emotion without noise is really important to my experience of a place. That's why I like places like Firefly here as well. I like places yeah. like Hearth in New York City, not too big. Uh, the cool thing about St. Vincent, you might not know this, um, you can order any bottle of wine off the menu and they'll sell you a half bottle. So they'll cool. pop it and they'll that's pour you two cool. glasses. So if you don't want to spend the price for a full bottle of wine, you can try anything you want out. So. Super cool. So uh, you you almost jostled this yeah. uh, Judge Dredd firearm and and uh, killed our dear cinematographer. So I've been on what some I've been on some uh, adventures lately. Um, you may or may not have seen my raccoon toss on YouTube, uh, YouTube.com/slash Kevin Rose. This was going around the internet. A raccoon uh, at attacked my dog, and I ended up um, throwing the raccoon. It was. A dumb call, don't do this at home. It, it, this is my dog Toaster, who does not like Tim Ferriss. He so that's loves why me. Toast looks awkward. Oh, <laughs> that was sweet. Um, so anyway, long story short, it got me thinking about home defense. It got me thinking about raccoon defense. And um, one of the things that, that, that I thought of, uh, more so for home defense, is, was a taser. And the reason that I thought of the taser is that, you know, I was raised with firearms. I was, you know, in the Scouts, Eagle Scout. They give you a gun when you and run No, 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 scouts. but you had to take, you had to take a bunch of different, like I have my rifle, my badge, and all that marksmanship and all yeah. that stuff. So anyway, long story short, I'm comfortable with guns. And of course I have a, a gun at home, but I feel that like the most common thing that's gonna happen to you, I mean, yes, it can be the occasional person breaking into your house and that wants to harm you, but most likely, it's a drunk person, it's someone on drugs, it just gets lost, and it's like, you know, Prager, uh, one of our friends, um, actually had a person break into his house and he came home and they were sleeping in his bed. You gotta get up, you gotta get up. And if I don't stop yelling at you, you're just gonna pass out, I can tell. I don't even know who you are, dude. <laughs> and the guy was just like super drunk, and but had that person been belligerent and trying to attack you, I want something that is not lethal. You yeah. know, I want something that can just like basically take someone down, subdue them so I, I can call the police. And so I purchased this thing, um, which is an actual taser, and you can actually buy them on taser.com, which is weird to me, but I, that's what I did. And um, it's actually pretty cool. This is, um, I've, I've turned it off so it's not, not armed right now, and the safety's on. But um, you can actually pull out each of the individual cartridges like this. And each of these will deploy um, two prongs, and then obviously tase them so they, they'll drop to the ground. Uh, and so this is a semi-automatic. So most tasers you think it's like one pull, it shoots, and then that's kind of it. Yep. So if you miss, 
um, you can actually uh, deploy it twice. It also has, uh, you know, laser. I don't know if you can see that on the camera, but it has laser and a light. Um, and it's got a little digital display here. Anyway, they're not cheap. Uh, they'll cost you a little over a thousand bucks. But you know, at the end of the day, this thing's gonna last you forever. It comes with rechargeable batteries and you can buy new cartridges for pretty cheap, uh, like 40 bucks for two or something like that. And you know, it just gives you peace of mind. It gives you peace of mind against a bunch of craziness. And I just like, I feel like, um, you know, guns, uh, you know, as you've seen in the press lately, I mean, they're really, they're really scary and they do a lot of damage and it's unfortunate yeah. when accidents happen and weird things happen all the time. So it's like, um, I just don't want to have that be my first thing to go to. You know yeah. what I mean? Yeah. Uh, what, do you, what do you think about this? Because I know you're a gun guy as well. Yeah, never was, never was a gun guy, and then became fascinated by. No, I became. I know it's funny how to set it up. Oh no, I was. Uh, no, I no, 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 I'm not getting. Now I have about seven it. fully automatic now weapons. I have seven. I have a Gatling gun mounted <laughs> yeah. on my VW Golf, but the. Uh, I find firearms interesting in the same way that I find archery interesting. Are very highly precise sure. firing motor skills. Well, you're into hunting uh, too. Which I never was in prior to the Four Hour Chef, and then had my first experience. Uh, on a deer hunt with uh, an amazing uh, chef and hunter named Steve Rinella. You've met Steve, right? Or no? Steve Rinella is a fantastic writer for the New York Times, but he grew up in rural Michigan and started uh, trapping, among, among other things, when he was around 10 years old. And uh, wrote a book, a number of books, but uh, one of them was The Scavenger's Guide to Haute Cuisine, where he, he, uh, he recreated, I believe it was a three-day French banquet, a Scoffier banquet, something like 52 courses with foods that he foraged, kill and caught himself. Hmm. And uh, he took me on my first hunt and made, we made use of everything. He was very respectful. Is that the deer that you... Uh... That was the deer. Yeah, yeah I actually so had some of that. Yeah, you did. Yeah, for Thanksgiving, I think we had some uh, about, uh, about two years ago. So the my interest in guns... Uh, ex extends to home defense, but like you said, it's you don't want that to be your first knee-jerk response necessarily. You've got a lot of knives though, you're a knife guy. I have knives, I have tomahawks, I have bow and arrows, <laughs> I have... Uh, I think what I would probably... Uh, I, number one, for t deterrence, what uh, I've done a lot of reading on this, there Pepper are spray. actually lights, and it, it's almost like a car alarm that has a flashing red light. There's, there's been a, a fair number of uh, home entry or like forced entries or break-in uh, studies done just looking at, at data across say some of the security companies and it's it's very simple to use cheap devices that you can get on Amazon for 20 or 30 dollars that are intended to scare away deer for instance that have like red flashing lights and you can mount those on, on some of your exterior doors and they're very effective for deterring like the nine out of ten thieves hmm. that are looking for low-hanging fruit. So I actually started, uh, and I learned that because fruit. I was looking for uh, raccoon deterrence. Because there are a lot of raccoons here, and in they're your, big in your and they're area aggressive. Too. They're all over the place, and they're really aggressive and big. Uh, so I gave you the granulated coyote urine right. powder, did, which, clearly that didn't work, which did not work, but it was also in the wrong place. But that's okay. No, did it work? They, like, no, they toast him. They they attacked toast after we used it. But they stopped digging in our garden. Ah, uh, okay. So it's just good for came in the backyard. No, put it in the garden. Ah, see, there we go. So it was only in the garden, but so uh, we're, wait a second. You gave us the granulated you go to coyote P -mart P and we put it com. over our vegetables. No, well, was, remember they were digging in the lawn. I know they were digging in the lawn. Stop doing that. But why would we put that on our veggies? I don't want coyote <laughs> urine on my vegetables. <laughs> anyway, so apparently my vegetables are. Yeah. So if, so you. for me, I think. Um, I have firearm for last resort, and the uh, phone for break-in, and then um, numerous like light light activation, security cameras, etc. Uh, for both deterrent. inside as well. Inside out, yeah, inside as like well. Like a disco ball comes down, it's like club <laughs> music comes on. Exactly. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> but uh, light deterrence. Have you heard yeah. about those really high-powered LEDs that are supposed to blind people? Yeah, like for like I 15 have, minutes. Yeah, you can get like the uh, Surefire yeah. Defender. I but not no, not just a flashlight. I'm talking about the ones that do that burst of like super bright can, light. There are flashlights that you can purchase that will actually burn paper if you hold them on paper. 
Yeah, uh, I've heard about those. And the, the intention of, say, the, you know, the, the executive defender or some of these Surefire products or related defense flashlights, they would call them, is number one, you can temporarily blind an assailant. Right. And then it has a For like 15 minutes, right? Oh, not even. It's probably more like you know, 30, 60 seconds. And then there's a beveled edge that you could use for. Oh, interesting. Skull cracking, which I haven't done. Thank do you God. have one of those Surefire lights? I do. It was given to me by a hedge fund manager. They get into it. So there were, there's about 200 pages of the four-hour chef that I had to cut because my one of my editors was like, Tim, you can't have <laughs> like a 20-page spread of blueprints for a hedge fund manager's apocalypse-proof. Yeah, this is the guy that Texas. owns like the tank, right? He has a tank from Northern Ireland that he bought. This is ridiculous. Uh, and I got really into it. So he gave me a Surefire flashlight. Sweet. So, uh, getting away from Apocalypse, uh, you met one of my favorite performers recently. Yes, uh, David Copperfield. So I went, um, I shoot this video series, if you're not familiar with the stuff that I do, uh, called Foundation, which typically interviews uh, founders, like entrepreneurs of startups, um, to try and like just distill and get some of their wisdom uh, and pass it on to others. And so, um, David Copperfield, uh, you know, like any, entrepreneur like that started from nothing like he obviously has a, a ton of great stories around um, you know his inspiration and what it took to get off the ground and you know how his parents uh, specifically his mom was really not into the fact that he was a magician and didn't think that was a career um, but anyway um, that will be live on foundation.kr on the interwebs but um, yeah he was an awesome guy he has an amazing collection of magic uh, out in Las Vegas he has this little private like basically um, bunker yeah. filled with uh, not only where he develops uh, his new magic um, and he's got a whole team of people that he works with to create new illusions um, but also as an archive and so he has the largest collection of Houdini uh, um, they call them gimmicks even though that, that's what like a, a, yeah. a gimmick to us sounds like that's a, an a industry hokey thing. Term it's an industry term for them paraphernalia um, yeah so um, he basically taught me a couple tricks and I want to show you one of them let's see it and let's see uh, how good I am at this. I might really screw this up. So um, I'm gonna Don't have edit this out. Right? This is dead. Yeah, this is gonna be legit. I'm gonna have you take one of these cards. Um, okay. Actually, what I'll do to make it fair is I will take these cards and I will flip it like this, and you tell me when to stop. Okay. And when I stop, if you don't like the card that that you see, you can just tell me to do it again. I'll do it as many times as you want. Okay? okay. So tell me when. Stop. Okay. I don't like it. You don't like it? Okay. I want you to tell me when. Stop. You like that one? I don't, I don't like it. Okay, come on. <laughs> Stop. That one? That's great. Okay, now I want you to look at that card, mm -hmm. take it, make sure it's a real card, mm -hmm. and show it to any show it to anybody else. Like, okay. Okay. Okay, uh, put it back on the top there. Notice I'm not looking, I'm looking away. Mm -hmm. I'm gonna put this back on the deck. Oh gosh. Um, was it a red card? Yes. Probably a diamonds, yeah? Mm -hmm. And I'm gonna say probably a jack. Mm. It's a little Copperfield magic right there. That's it. <laughs> Bam. <laughs> it's good stuff. Not bad, huh? Yeah, that was good. Do you have any idea how I did it? Mm. Highly reflective kitchen no, table. No, no. <laughs> um, I'm not gonna reveal the trick on the of show. Of course not. I didn't think uh, you would. It's so funny, it's like, the magic is one of those things where like, it's fun to do, yeah. and you think it's cool, but like girls don't think it's cool at all. Like Daria, she had a couple of drinks the other night, yeah. and she's just like, magic, so like, it's not that cool. I think it depends and on I'm blood alcohol like, content. I know, I know, but like, it's cool to like do, and like, I, it's not. <laughs> see, she thinks it's not cool. It is, well, you know, here's the question. Juggling. Well, hold it's on, not, you can't, it's like, not as bad as you juggling. You can't like rock up in a singles bar and start juggling, but I mean, cards might be overplaying, but what if it's like sleight of hand involving well, slight of hand and I, like what? <laughs> slightly handling. Yeah. Uh, I think, I mean, I find it fascinating. I, I do think, too. I think close up magic. Girls do not, though. That's they think not they'll, true, they'll, they'll, no, I've seen David Blaine no, 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 at parties. No, 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 Maybe no. it's just David Blaine. I don't know. No, but. no, no. David Blaine is a badass. David Blaine is like, so here's the deal David Blaine is like Michael Jordan. Okay. Okay. So everybody wants to hang out with Michael Jordan. Right, right, right. But like if you're like a seventh grader like basketball player being like, look at how I can shoot, nobody cares how you can like shoot. Right, right, Do you know right, what right. I mean? <laughs> so it's like David Blaine's cool because he's freaking David Blaine. Right. 
Like, we're not cool with our like two or three magic tricks, right? Well, yeah, I'd fumble, I'd three finger monkey fumble the whole thing too. So yeah, I I'm that. sad that magic isn't cooler because I would like to be a semi-professional magician. <laughs> I want to know what a semi-professional magician does. That means you go to like rotary clubs and get paid five bucks an hour. I don't want to go to clubs, but it would be fun <laughs> to just like... Rotary clubs in the club. But it's close. I just want to like perform for friends and family. And get tips. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah. Like that. That's a good wine, by the way. What anyway, are we drinking? Uh, just a Pinot, Flowers Pinot. Flowers Pinot. What's that? It flowers. Uh, yeah, it's flowers. Yeah. It's a sea, sea View Ridge is the estate, hmm. but yeah, it's from flowers. So, um, so anyway, uh, magic's fun. <laughs> I've, I've been looking on, on YouTube. YouTube sadly has, oh, you know what? I do want to throw a shout out there to okay. um, this website that I really like. It's uh, theory11.com, okay. uh, theory11.com. It's done by like um, Copperfield's like, he's basically this dude that studies underneath him. Oh. And uh, it's really actually pretty brilliant. Like the guy is like, okay, listen, magic's gonna be all over the internet. Like you can go on, watch a super highly produced video and like download, do the digital download yeah. for like 10 bucks. And the magician, it's like Etsy for magicians. Okay. So it's crazy. Right. Magicians, like let's say for example, you come up with a trick and you're like, this trick's freaking awesome. I developed this trick. You bring it on there, they shoot a video with you if they think it's cool and original. Yeah. And then you get like 80% of the proceeds uh, and they're like they're basically selling a ton of magic on there. So they sell the instructional guide for well, it? Well, the video instructional guide. And if there's a gimmick associated with it, they sell that as well. But okay. essentially, like it's it's allowing like this whole new generation of magicians. Like they're saying, the guy was saying that it has some really young magicians that just come up with these amazing like illusions that basically um, end up on their website and selling you know tens of thousands of dollars worth of magic. That's cool. I'll That's give so cool. I'll give a website shout out. I don't know anyone involved with this site, but it is um, extremely addictive. I've had to cut back. Pornhub. Uh, Pornhub. Yes, but I'm not going <laughs> to give a shout out to Pornhub because everyone who's watching who's male and has at least one working hand knows Pornhub. So we'll move on. <laughs> the site is called... I just love to think that there's somebody there with no working hands. It's like, oh, I've never been there. Yeah. <laughs> so the, the site is Everyday Carry. So if you search, I think it's just edc.com or everydaycarry.com, it shows what various uh, guys carry on a daily basis, whether it's like the Surefire flashlight, uh, specific type wall. It has a definite sort of tactical defense angle. Uh, fixed blade knives or folding knives. That sounds pretty cool. It's awesome. And they so what they'll do is they'll take professional photography of these various kits like laid out in yeah. the OCD way. Yeah, like the and it's like the unboxing stuff that you see. Exactly, and it's a brilliant business because it's all affiliated. Oh, for right? sure. But it's so addictive. It was introduced to me by a Navy SEAL, uh, an amazing guy. Uh, and you have to get off the site as soon as you get on it, or you're just gonna spend hundreds of dollars. That's awesome. But you will find some very, very, very cool stuff. So that's, uh, that's websites. Anything else come to mind? Sites, books? Yeah, you, you're you reading. Yeah, I'm about 75% of the way through the book that you told me to pick up. Yeah. Have you talked about it on the show before? No. Do you, why don't you give so it to this is Daniel intro. Gilbert. Uh, Daniel Gilbert uh, is a Harvard, or at least was a Harvard professor uh, who uh, wrote a book called Stumbling, I think it's Stumbling Upon, could be Stumbling on Happiness, and it has covers of cherries, I believe, on the cover. And the basic premise is that what humans believe will make them happy seldom makes them happy. And that sounds very depressing until you dig into it and realize how you can potentially mitigate for that type of misdirection or self-delusion. And it's really just a fascinating study. Yeah, it's almost really like, fascinating. Almost like Dan Ariely's Predictably Irrational, where yeah. you're looking at I love Predictably how Irrational. odd people behave, where yeah. they'll say, all right, and the economist would But this is all about happiness. Like, it's all about happiness like and Things that you want in the future, whether it's money or other things, and like right. what you actually don't think about, like what's yep. missing. It's, exactly. It's, so I, that book was initially recommended to me by uh, an amazing Fortune 500 exec who'd, who had been at, on at different occasions, the C, I believe, C O O, C T O, and C F O of publicly traded companies. Hmm. This guy was a real operator, and it was his top book recommendation to me about three or four years ago. And that's when I recommended it. That's when awesome. He asked me for a nonfiction book. Did you do audio or are you reading? Audio, because I, I had to do a drive. I, I drove to Las Vegas from San Francisco. Good. 
when I was down there for the Copperfield interview and just listened to most of it on the way out there. So it was good. It actually, it was like, it was so good. I typically, I try to do like bursts of like audiobook for two hours while I'm driving, and then yeah. radio for a little bit, then audiobook. I was like five hours of audiobook nonstop. Nice. This was a really good book. What, uh, what were, just as a teaser, one or two of the main most memorable stories or takeaways or quotes or thoughts from Copperfield? Because I used to watch his specials. Do you remember? Of course, you know, yeah. especially like walking through the Great Wall of China or whatever. I used to watch those with my family. So I'm just, I'm just super curious. Yeah, I mean, I think that the Copperfield uh, thing, he talked about just um, what's actually required, like why and how he tries to really entertain the audience. And for him, it's not about like magic so much as it is about theater. Hmm. And so for him, he's always wanted to be a performer. Yeah. And he didn't necessarily want to be a magician. So he was like, how can I really, and he just happened to be good at magic. Yeah. And so he's like, I want to turn this into a, like a, a, a thing that just like blows people's minds and is also theater at the same time. And so he'll, he'll oftentimes, like if he, if he comes up with a new illusion, he'll try and find two or three ways to do the same thing. Hmm. And he does that in case anyone finds out how he does the illusion. Hmm. It's really interesting because he said that he was in, in Germany and he, he figured out how to um, levitate for the first time. Okay. And he was doing this show in Germany, and apparently someone that worked on the stage or something like that went to the paper, the local German paper, and he was performing there for like a week or two weeks or something like this. And they basically wrote up this big long thing about David Copperfield, this, this is how he does it, blah, blah, blah. And, um, and everyone was just like, you know, he came out on stage and he's like, hey, listen, I, you may have heard that how I you know, do the levitation thing, blah, blah, blah. And people were like, boo. Yeah. And he was like, I think they were booing me because they were just like trying to say like, oh, that sucks. That kind of like, we're not going to get to see it. Yeah. Uh, or we're going to know how it's done. And he's like, I just want to show you it's not done like that. And he basically like showed the way that it was like done and, and did it a completely different way. And like he got a standing ovation and everything awesome. and like blew people's minds. And so That's cool. he just like, he's like such a like a, a hacker and he's such a like, he loves... Oh, he found out that Da Vinci actually wrote a magic book. Huh. And so, and like Da Vinci was into magic. And so like, yeah. he, he's like a big fan of Da Vinci and filmmakers. And he's just such a fascinating, well-rounded guy. He's not just your standard like, you know, I'm gonna try and do some crazy, like, he doesn't like, he wasn't slamming street magic, but he was saying that like, that's just not me. I wanna do something much larger for a bigger yeah. audience. And I wanna, it's all about the performance for me. Yeah. And do work seven days a week yeah. for like months on end. Yeah. Like it's just insane. He just absolutely loves it. It's it's pretty awesome. Cool. Good for him. So the uh, what drew you to David Copperfield? Why did that happen? Well, you know, honestly, um, I just uh, I had got a chance to hang out with David Blaine. Yeah. Um, and he performed for Dari and I at a, at, a, at a house that we were at one time and we were blown away. Yeah. And you know, I'd always, like any kid, had been a fan of magic. Yeah. And so, um, uh, it was one of those things where I saw Copperfield on Twitter and I, I had mentioned him or something like that and then he DM'd me and he's like, if you're ever in town, let me know. And so like, I just met up with him one time in Vegas and then he gave me the whole tour of his place and stuff like that. And uh, you know, it was one of those things where I got to know him over Twitter, just changing, trading DMs from time to time. Yeah. And he's just a really cool dude and like, I just really admire what he's built. Like he's obviously, he's got like 30 plus Emmys or something like that that he's just yeah. been insanely successful. And so, um, you know, it was one of those things where when you get the chance to interview someone like that, like, why not? Like, yeah. there's, there's, there has to be nuggets of gold in there that you can share with other people. So, hmm. um, I'm thinking about starting my own monthly podcast. I'm not really? Sure if I told you this. Yeah. No. So I've, I've been, I've been fantasizing about having a monthly audio podcast. Tim Talk? Tim Talk. <laughs> Tim 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 Talk. Tim Tim Talk Talk. And... <laughs> Call it Tim Tim Talk Talk. No. Come on, dude. Tim Tim, Tim Talk Talk. Hello, welcome to Tim Tim Talk Talk. This is Tim Tim. <laughs> you, you, welcome okay. to Talk Talk. I you could, can, you can take you can take I phone could, calls. I could do that. Uh, but I I've been I've really enjoyed being on podcasts like uh, Joe Rogan podcast. Uh, Audio or video? 
Well, he does Ustream, but it's it's predominantly audio. But you would syndicate it through like iTunes and all that stuff. Yeah, definitely. And uh, I've really enjoyed the longer formats, like Mark Maron, same story. I mean, just doing like one and a half to three hours on a super. Would you long. have guests over? No, exactly. Just like monologue for that. You did Tim Tim Talk Talk the entire time. <laughs> Tim Tim Talk Talk long long. Uh, so I would I would have guests. That's part of the appeal is that I feel like I could I could seek out one or two people a month maybe that I find really really fascinating that I, I want to dig, about this dig into. You have uh, to get a studio for this though. Well, I was thinking about just using Creative Live down oh, the street. Oh, cool. Maybe. Yeah, that's a startup be... I'm, I'm involved with, creativelive.com. They have amazing production value. But I could also, like you know, Graham was saying, I have the Zoom recorder. Maybe grab a couple of uh, stand-up mics. And I've had podcasters like Aisha Tyler, uh, Brian Callen do this just like out of a backpack. Mm -hmm. uh, and they turn out wonderfully high quality. Uh, so I've, I've been I've been thinking about that because I'd like to explore explore other formats outside of text, uh, but video can be very involved. I enjoy video, but I think if I'm on the on the road, especially, it could be really fun to do a monthly podcast. Who should I interview? Who should my three first interviews be? Do you think? It could be anything. I don't I don't think it would uh, be limited to business necessarily. Just like David Copperfield, although there is a business. Well, what, so tell me, like, if you're going to do this podcast, like, what yeah. is the thing that you're curious about? Like, when I do foundation, I specifically want to get at that like entrepreneurial spirit that is like, yeah. Yeah, I, I, I'm, what I'm trying to go for is I'm trying to like pull out and show to people that these entrepreneurs that build Twitter or any of these companies that I've interviewed, like Elon Musk with Tesla, it's like. They're just everyday people that just say, you know what, I think I can do this and yeah. just freaking go after it, right? Yeah. So I'm trying to like get a little bit of that along with a little bit of wisdom on how they got to where they are along the way. Yeah. Like what is it that you're going after? I think for me it would just be, it would be very much in line with my personality and, and the books and the way that I think about the world and try to dissect it in so much as I would take someone who's really good at anything, it doesn't really matter. It could be guitar, singing, opera, you know, uh, BMX, it just doesn't matter. Uh, and try to pull out the 80-20 analysis of the nuggets that have helped make them successful. So what are the principles or the practice habits or the beliefs or the quotes mm -hmm. that have made a huge difference to them mm -hmm. that other people might be able to apply? Like this David Copperfield principle of like always have three ways you can do something. Like that's awesome. Like I, yeah. you could apply that to so many situations, sure. right? You could apply that to deal making, negotiating. Sure. You could apply it to. That's awesome. So you're thinking like yeah. you want to sit down with an artisan, like someone that is like super passionate about their craft. It could be ever anyone that's like someone that's fermenting like freaking kimchi is the best in the world. Yeah. And you're like, if, as long as they're what the do best you do? At what they do, they can be the best janitor in the world. I don't care. Like as long as they're. Like That's actually the pretty top cool. Of the top. I'd watch that. That'd be really fun. Hmm? Yeah. yeah. I'd be I'd be really really psyched just to explore. I think it'd be really fun. Yeah. Yeah. Totally. Uh, and yeah, I've just been intimidated because I've listened to some podcasts that are very well produced by let's say professional actors like Alec Baldwin has an amazing podcast or people who have it a just very comes down to good mics, dude. You just it comes down to good mics. Yeah, you need good mics. I feel like, like I a ramble a SLR. lot. I don't know if that's okay. I guess it's okay. I just I, I don't feel like I'm as polished as people who come into it with say stand up background or radio uh, hosting background or let's say Larry King type interviewing background, but I I feel like Maybe that's okay. I just get insecure about it because I well, feel like I, I think would that ramble like, and meander quite a lot. So we, we ramble a little bit, but I think that like if you look at the good, the, the really good show. Yeah, it is a random show. If you look at the really good podcasters, like a Leo Laporte or someone that yeah. has a lot of TV yeah. experience, one of the things I'm, I noticed he is he's a good pod, he has a good voice for it. Too. He has a good voice for it, but he's also really good at like understanding when the interview is going long mm. or it's going off the rails mm. and how to like bring it quickly back in and bring that person back on track. So yeah. even interrupting someone to like pull them in. Yeah, yeah. And as long as you can get that, that that's something you'll pick up with a handful of episodes, I'm yeah. sure. Cool. Any requests? What kind of folks would you want? I, I mean, I, I just really like the idea of you going around and seeing like the best of the best. Like if you yeah. took me to like the best artisan knife maker or yeah. like, you know, I mean, I'm in a weird shit, like sous vide person, like mm -hmm. some of the best chefs out there, like 
like kimchi maker, yeah. like you know, it doesn't matter what it what it is. They're all characters too. I mean, like it, I feel like there's a common thread too. That's one of the things I noticed in doing the foundation series yeah. is like there's a few like key things that like I'll have to go back and like make notes for each episode. But I feel like there's 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 some some level of common thread. What that, are like, some of the common threads? Like if you had to think about, I it for think a for sure the one thing uh, we were talking about. And this these are dinner. just so people know. I mean, you have some very high caliber folks on. I mean, you've got like Jack Dorsey. You've got who created Twitter. Yeah, Evan Williams, Evan blogger, Williams. Twitter, uh, Elon Musk, uh, a bunch of like people. Yeah, that, just for context. So, yeah, some, so what are the common commonalities? I, I think one of the things that uh, we talked about this at dinner that is absolutely true is that they surround themselves with like people that are smarter and more talented than they are. So they yeah. they demand to work with the absolute top best one percent of talent out there, mm -hmm. and you know Google. It's 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 a really crazy thing. Like when I when I first joined Google, I didn't know what to expect and to go in there because you always hear these stories about Google and the crazy tests they have and the bar they have for talent. And it's like, you know, everyone there is just like extremely, just like they're, they're just top of the class. Like just yeah. like they 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 hire the absolute best engineers. Yeah. And and you can see it in their products, and maybe not so much on the design side. I think they could use some help there. Yeah. Um, but certainly, like technically, when it comes to like organizing and making sense of the world's information, like yeah. no doubt, the Google's the best. So it's just like you know, just demanding excellence. And like Jack Dorsey said it best. My first interview, uh, foundation. He you know he created. He was the inventor of Twitter and also of Square, the credit card payment processing system. Uh, one of the things that he said is that it's also about editing the team. I think leaders of companies have to consider themselves editors, and you constantly have to edit the team. You constantly have to make sure that you have the best people in, and if there's any negative attribute within the team, person or element or otherwise, you have to part ways. Like knowing when someone isn't the right fit and, and being like okay with the fact that you need to let them go they, they'll, they'll be better off in the long term and so will your, your business. And it's like just knowing to that to always constantly be editing your team and just demanding that you work with the best people I think is a, is a big one. Here's a tough question for you. What, what is your, what do you think the right approach is? What are some tricks for firing people? Fortunately, I don't have to do that. Yeah. I've had to do some of that before. It's always extremely difficult. What, what is the, what are some tips or tricks or approaches even phrases well, that you found I, helpful for firing. People. I think that there's there's a couple things. One, you have to know if someone is a star talent but an underperformer, in which case mm -hmm. they could be coached potentially to get back on track. Yeah. Or if they, they're just talent isn't matched for the position, right? Yeah. Because that's someone that you need to fire. One yeah. is one that can potentially be coached. Um, but as far as letting someone go, um, I think everyone wants to know and understand like why this is happening and understand like it, it can't just be some blanket statement like oh we're downsizing or something like that. You have to be honest with these people, right? So it's like it's a matter of sitting down and I've had to do layoffs, I've had to let certain individuals go in the past and it, it's it's never easy. It's just like getting them out of the environment, out of the away from the office for, for a bit and sitting down and talking to them about like why uh, it doesn't make sense for them to continue on the team in this particular role because you're looking for someone else to fill that position. Yeah, and it's it's you know typically you're able to sit down and point to two to three key things that is just not working out. Yeah, and um, you know it's it's one of these things where I never try to make it a confrontational type thing. It's kind of like you're very um, uh, yeah, yeah, but you're also like you, you let them know that this is not a this is not a debate or discussion. Like it's it's kind of a done deal. You've already decided this. Yeah. Um, I mean, there's a lot of things that you have to do. Like you have to have their paperwork prepared ahead of time, their last paycheck prepared ahead of time. Like a lot of stuff that you would give them as part of their departure. Yeah. Um, planning the time of day so that they don't have to go back and face coworkers necessarily is always a good thing. Do you and do that on a Friday then also. Yeah, or? certainly a Friday. Like that's yeah. that's definitely the best day to do it. And then also, just you know, you don't want to do it when they're going to walk into like a full room of people. You know, mm -hmm. you want to let them pack up their stuff and and, and exit gracefully. But um, the other thing is just like understanding where they're strong and offering potential help. You know, mm -hmm. saying like. 
uh, hey, you know, I, I believe that you're really good at these things and I will absolutely give you a, a quality recommendation in this area and I can hopefully try and help you find another position. Got it. And like, of course people don't want to hear that for the first few days, but I've had many employees that I've had to let go that would then later come back and say like, you know, I was pissed off obviously for a week, yeah. but now like, yeah, you're right. Like, I think I, I'd like to pursue something in this area or what do you know about mm -hmm. the, anyone hiring in this particular position? And you know, you try and help them out. Um, but I think the most important thing is to do right by the person, meaning like, you know, I've always been really good at like thinking about proper severance packages, especially for people that have been there for a certain length of tenure, like you want to mm -hmm. give them the appropriate amount of compensation so that they can get back on their feet. Um, but the most important thing is that um, I find that a lot of people will delay these things. Yeah. And the co common reasons why people delay letting people go is they say like, well, it would really hurt us right now to let this person go. Let's backfill them first. Let's find another person to replace them and then we'll let them go. That's just like, that's I, I don't believe in that. I think it's BS. It's just like a great way to keep pushing things yeah. off. I think the easiest way is just like, you kind of have to just rip the Band-Aid off, let them go and then find someone Improvise. to fill, fill the role. Yeah, when people will always fill in. When you're sitting down with somebody having a cup of coffee and you're having the small talk and blah, 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 and then you know you need to segue into that sure. departure conversation. What's the phrase? Are you like, there's no easy way to say this, but got something to tell you? I mean, no, you just say like, hey, uh, gosh, I haven't done this in a while, but like you just sit down and say, you know, um, I wanted to talk to you about uh, your position at the company, and I, I think that, um, you know, clearly, typically there's some things that have been missed in, in, their, in their job performance. Meaning like you'll, it's not like this is gonna be out of the blue for a lot of people because they'll have missed certain milestones or they won't be yeah. performing. They, they've written bad code that hasn't scaled properly or something will have come up where you can sit down and say like, hey, X, Y, and Z haven't gone the best over the last few months. Uh, and you know, we've decided to move on and we'd like to part ways. Uh, I wanna let you know that this isn't like something that, that I'm holding against you personally. You know, I think that you're great at X, Y, and Z, and I want to try and help you out potentially with these things and finding another role somewhere place else. And I put together this package for you, and that's when you have your envelope and all your stuff with you, right. and blah blah blah. Got it. And then you, it's not fun. Then you grab them and you give them a kiss. Exactly. Like, you departure, broke my heart. A departure, you broke my heart. A departure kiss is always <laughs> it's welcome it's in always most cultures. Always good for HR. Yeah. yeah. All right. Cool. Thank you for that. It's, it's all, it's, are you firing someone? No, I'm not. Too? Yeah, sorry if you found out about this on this podcast. <laughs> no, 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 I'm not firing anybody. I just think it's, it's a very common problem. I think a lot of businesses, thank you. I think a lot of businesses fail because they don't replace people. And it's very true. And, uh, or, you know, we've talked about this before, but I've had a bunch of startups. Yeah, I've, I've heard. I've had a, no, I'm just saying I've had a bunch of startups that, that, um, you know, the toughest job as a CEO is you have to have that backbone. Yep. You know, I, I know some great people. I'm talking like you would let them watch. I let them watch Toaster. I let them do what you know what I mean. But like they just don't have that backbone to step up yep. and like make those tough calls. And like yep. honestly, it, a CEO at times has to be a little bit of a dick and like yeah. be willing to like you know um, do that. So be, be right and not universally liked. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. What I mean, do you? Do you read business books? I don't even know. Do you I don't, read? No. You don't, right? Not really, no. So how do you choose the books that you read? Mostly through you. <laughs> <laughs> no, well, I mean, you like the Graveyard Book, right? I loved it. Oh my God. I just have to, ooh, I like that. So just to, I, I mean, I'm such a fanboy with Neil Gaiman, but if you have not, for audiobooks, listen to fiction, yes, I know, I know, I know, nonfiction bigots, I listen to nonfiction or watched or read, not watched, read only nonfiction for like 15 years because I thought, well, if, I'm, if someone's gonna make something up, I can do that myself, not true. I hate that shit, I hate so, nonfiction. So, well, you hate fiction? Fiction, yeah, I hate Yeah, fiction. so Graveyard Book, The Graveyard Book by Neil Gaiman as an audiobook, it's amazing. So, you said that. I highly recommend uh, Daria will find good books too. She finds, so my wife, you, who else do we like, go to for books? Daria, what's your, any, any favorites of the last? She's listening to some depressing ones right now. What's that cancer one you're listening to? <laughs> a heartbreaking work of staggering genius. A heartbreaking work of staggering it, it genius. It's a little too close to home. It's, it's tough to read. Yeah. What about anything, anything uplifting, empowering, um, illuminating? Oh, I love sci-fi. I'm reading, um, do you know uh, Peter Hamilton? 
Peter Hamilton? I don't know Peter Hamilton. Amazing science fiction writer. Really? Like Isaac Asimov. Really? Like, like okay. the next level. Any particular title? Uh, well, my the first thing I discovered through him was the reality dysfunction. The reality the Night, dysfunction, the okay. Night, the Night's Dawn trilogy, ah. unbelievable. But I just started the Pandora Star. Pandora Star, cool. It's, um, I like sci-fi. Do you read any sci-fi? Uh, I've read Foundation, which she turned me on to, which uh, I thought yeah. was great. Graham, how about you? You got any good books you like? I've been reading Predictably Irrational. Predictably Irrational yeah. is always yeah. a really freaking. Good. It's yeah. a great favorite. Uh, have you read Ender's Game? Mm -mm. I hear it's awesome. Oh, come on. Well, I mean, maybe it's more of a boy thing. I don't know. It, it might be a... Why is it a more boy, boy thing? What's that? Why is it well, more I don't thing? want to spoil the plot. Uh, I mean, they're making it into a feature film, which... Uh, I don't know. I always get like anxious when my stuff I like gets made into feature right, films. I just read better sci-fi. Have you read Stranger in a Strange Land? I haven't. That is amazing. If you guys want to read... Good. So I rely, you rely on me. I rely on my mom and my brother mm -hmm. because they, they're very, very opinionated when it comes to books. So if they both like something, usually it's really, really good. And that very rarely happens. It's happened with Stranger in a Strange Land where they're both like, oh my God, you haven't read that? You have to read it by Heinlein, which for those people in tech, if you've ever heard the expression grok, oh, I don't rock this, they don't grok that, that's from no way. Stranger in a Strange Land. I didn't Land. know that. Yeah. And that's pretty awesome. Uh, it's about a, a Martian or alien raised on Earth. It's fascinating, it's a really good book. Uh, another one is Motherless Brooklyn by Jonathan Lethem about a detective in, uh, I think it's Brooklyn with, of course, Motherless Brooklyn, with Tourette's Syndrome. So it's about a detective with Tourette's Syndrome. It is that sounds horrible. hilarious. Yeah, yeah it's great, funny. it's great. <laughs> yeah, yeah, oh yeah, exactly. It's very, very good. Uh, Sweet, anything else uh, you haven't covered yet? Startup stuff? I'm trying to think. I feel like if there's anything that we've... Stocks, anything interesting? What do you think about Tesla? <laughs> Look, I, I like Tesla. I mean, I like Tesla. I'm biased because I have a lot of friends who are investors. Um, it's, it's clearly done very well. Uh, give, me your, I, give me your like top three stock picks right now. I, so I want to know the Tim Ferriss so stock picks. So here's the picks. thing. I, I will tell you, you have big balls when it comes to public stocks. I have little chihuahua balls when it comes to public stocks. <laughs> Those are small balls. Those are small. I, I don't, actually, I don't know. Maybe they have big balls. I'm not sure. But I the, the so. metaphorically speaking, <laughs> raisin balls. Because I feel like I do not have an informational <laughs> advantage when it comes to public tr publicly traded stocks, nor do I have the ability to influence outcomes typically. So I think you're better at, at, at framing investing in public stocks. I've just never had the stomach for it. Because if I invest in a startup... Do you, you know, own any public stocks right now? No. I have a little bit of money in indexes. Otherwise, it's all in either cash-like equivalents or cash and startups. That's it's it. cash-like equivalents. Like, like, like tre treasury bills and stuff yeah, yeah. of various types. Uh, but I don't think I own any publicly traded stocks. For a hmm. long time, I owned so Amazon. What's your for, for a long time, I owned Amazon. The first stock... I, I still own I, I don't think I ever told you this. The first stock I ever bought when I was 14 borrowed money from my dad to do, it was Pixar. If I had held on to that, oh my God, even with that small You'd be amount, set for life. Oh, well, <laughs> <laughs> he just, oh man, I would have loved to have held and on to that. How much did you put, like $12 in or something? <laughs> I made pretty good money. Like, I was busing like tables. I was busing restaurants in East Hampton and Montauk and made pretty good money. Like put a couple thousand dollars in. Uh, I also borrowed some money from my dad to get it done, but, uh, what are your top three picks? I don't. I don't have. Uh, I don't follow the public markets much. I, I just don't feel like that's a game where I can win. So I mean, it's really. It's really. Um, for me, it, it, I take the old Warren Buffett advice, where like if you're buying a stock, you should forget about it for five years. And so I, I try to think long about these companies and just think like, where is this company going to potentially be in five years? And then I, I try to like put it into different buckets based on like the type of company it is. So. I have some for like uh, speculation that are like super high risk. Like you know, I try and put JT Marlin and Associates. No, like <laughs> I try to put like ten to twenty percent of my assets in like super high risk, like speculation yeah. and like crazy shit. Uh, what would be an example of that kind of Tesla? Stuff? 
Tesla's okay. a great example. Yeah. It's like, it's, 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 you know, obviously they're selling cars, but are electric cars the future? Uh, are these charging stations gonna work? Blah, blah, blah. Like, is that's still, I mean, it's a 10, it's a 15, 14 billion dollar company. Yeah. And like, you know, Ford and Toyota is a 150 billion dollar company or something like it's relatively small to everyone else in the market, right? So still unproven. Um, and then there's growth companies like, you know, uh, and Amazon, I mm -hmm. would put in growth. I'm, I'm still very, I mean, I don't own any Amazon right now, but I'm still very bullish on Amazon. I am as well. They're so, the only, well, maybe you can think of another exception. They're the only publicly traded company, at least that gets a lot of press that I'm aware of, that continually gets a pass from Wall Street for not thinking short term. Like, it's just incredible. Well, the, the reason why they get a pass is because they're taking all of their money. They could be profitable at any time. Yeah, they're just But they're taking all their money and growth. reinvesting it, right? Yeah. So they're a growth company, and that's fine. That's why they have the crazy multiple that they have on their earnings, right? Yeah. They're like 1,100 or something on their, their yeah. price to earnings. So the thing that I think is, um, so I, I, I don't own that many stocks. I only own like three or four stocks, so not a ton. So uh, let me tell you about Tesla. Let me talk, let's talk about Tesla real quick. Tesla, it's not because of the cars. I think the cars are awesome. I think it's pretty big, like size-wise. I think they need to make a smaller one, but obviously that, all that stuff is coming. What got me excited about Tesla is like somebody explained to me that they said, look, they're building out all these supercharging stations across the United States that can swap batteries, like a full swap out of a car in like under 60 seconds. So you drive up, you're on this platform, they swap out the batteries, they put fresh ones in and you drive off, right? But you pay Tesla. So somebody was saying to me, don't think of Tesla just as an auto automobile manufacturer, but also think of them as like an Exxon, uh, because they're providing the power for the vehicles. Uh, and so they provide like a standard, or if they ever decide to open that standard, and they just like roll out this chain of charging stations on an open standard, like they are the next Exxon. Hmm. Uh, so that was, obviously that's not a $14 billion company. <laughs> that's a, yeah, that's yeah, you much know, larger. much, much They've, larger. There have been some very interesting experiments in Israel done by one oh, yeah, of the well, right. former it didn't executive work. from SAP. It didn't uh, work. You're talking about the swap out charging stations yeah. that were done out there? Mm -hmm. Yeah, but I think Tesla, it, the timing is right. Yeah. Anyway, we'll see if the timing's right. Maybe we're yeah, still just because it doesn't years. work once doesn't mean it won't work the second. Yeah, time, right? it's like you look at MP3 players prior sure. to the iPod. Sure, right? there was a few of them that just didn't. Yeah, yeah. the Diamond Rio. There was yeah, a there were a bunch of ones. them. Yeah. Uh, so that's one. Amazon, obviously, they own e-commerce online. It's only going to get bigger over time. People yeah. are tired of driving around. It's just like it's, laziness always wins, and so does Amazon Prime. <laughs> invest in laziness. Like invest in laziness. That's why I do Amazon. <laughs> I buy Apple. I own a yeah. bunch of Apple. And the reason I own Apple is because they still have Johnny Ive. He's an amazing industrial designer. Yeah. He's the best of the best. They've got a TV in the works. They've got a watch in the works. Like these are, are big product categories that I think if they reimagine will yeah. be big chunks of uh, their, you know, they, they, the potential for those categories is like that of, you know, another iPad or something like that. I'm not gonna say the iPhone because the iPhone is just like unmatched, yeah. but um, they, they're down 30% from their 52 week high right now. I think it's just a good buy. Yeah. Um, so what else? Uh, I think that's about it. I watch LinkedIn, I watch Netflix. I just like, I kind of track them. I'm really excited to see, just as a side note, uh, has it already happened? Have the Emmys already happened? I was September. September, right? So I was very excited. I'm very excited to see how that shakes out because I think House of Cards on Netflix is up for seven yeah. Emmys. And I feel like whoever determines the Emmys, the Academy of Emmys, I have no idea. I'm an idiot when it comes to that stuff, almost has to give them one or two or they'll seem spiteful. And that is a real watershed moment for television where you have a... a production on a platform like Netflix taking one of the crown jewels in terms of prizes or awards in television. I mean, I, I just think television as we know it is going to change, as I think you would agree. I agree. So I much agree. I just don't years. know if Netflix is the one to do it. I won't place a buy because I just like, I'm looking at Netflix and then like, Right now, it just opens. It, it's, it's really just a crow, fragile. It's just a crowbar that opens the door for other no doubt. as well. And that's that's what I'm worried about. Like honestly, I mean, you look like at I mean, Game of Thrones. Holy shit! I mean, yeah, but, but, but the think, amount of time that they have to produce, the budget they have. Sure, it's amazing. But, but but think about this too. Like think about the fact that like if there is an app ecosystem for television, that means that independent like little production companies mm -hmm. can fund 
potentially crowdsource like a full blown mini series, right? Yeah. In which case, where does that put Netflix? You know what I mean? Yeah, like yeah. maybe Game of Thrones, the production company behind it, says, "Oh, we don't need HBO. We're going to go raise ten million bucks from you know X, Y, and Z investors." Yeah. We have you or know. Or just Kickstarter. Yeah, or or Kickstarter. We have. <laughs> Can you imagine if the creators of Game of Thrones went on fucking Kickstarter? I mean, it could happen <laughs> if something oh like God. that got canceled. It could happen. So yeah. I don't know. It's it's like it's kind of early days, and I, yeah. obviously there's a lot of money to be made in the early days. Yeah. But I still Netflix just. Uh, Speaking of Game of Thrones, side note, um, I, I mentioned this on Twitter briefly, but like I don't have many fanboy moments, but I was in LA for the last few days, and I sat down at dinner and looked at the table next to me, and it was, I guess it's Daenerys, but everyone calls her Khaleesi, and no way. Jon Snow, and Jon Snow sitting at dinner, no way, eating together with a bunch of other people, and I was just like, Khaleesi oh. and Jon Snow, <laughs> yeah. she's small. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Did you go over there and say hi? No. Dude, are you kidding me? Totally did not. I Why could, not? I couldn't do it because they were chilling. They were on the chill. I bumped into Jon Snow and, like, as he was coming out of the bathroom, like, adjusting his fly. I was like, oh, that's awkward. I don't to... know what to do with your tongue, Jon Snow. Yeah, yeah exactly. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> you should have said that. You should have been like, I like what you do with your tongue, As he Jon comes Snow. out of the bathroom, uh, I'd be like, call me. <laughs> yeah, right. So, <laughs> anyway. Why didn't you go say hi to Khaleesi? She has dragons. You're single. She has dragons. I'm single. She's uh, she is. <laughs> She's probably single. <laughs> who knows? She might be. I don't. She brought up one of your dude, books. She was with Jon Snow. I'm not gonna be Jon. Yeah, Snow. but they know who you are. They see oh, your book. There's no way. Oh, well, maybe. They, I don't know. Maybe they might have seen saying. your book somewhere in like the airport. She'd be like, oh my god, I lost forty pounds on my forearm before, body before yeah, I went on Game of Thrones. I'd be like, well, right. exactly. And you have dragons. Let's talk. But. Uh, that was they, a missed opportunity, dude. It, well, yeah, I, I for a actually, single man like yourself, I don't, I don't view it as a missed opportunity because. Are you with on a date or something? I may have been, uh, <laughs> but you're but, like, pardon me. Uh, I'm gonna go. <laughs> here and I'm gonna get Khaleesi's number real quick. But uh, I, you kind of look like the dude struggle. she was into. What was the dude she was into? Are you talking about the like guard guy? The Khaleesi. What was her man? Are you talking? To, oh, you're talking. Drogo. Drogo. You oh kind of look God. like Drogo. I look like Drogo. Yeah. I just want to be. You know what? I was telling someone the other. I was. This is called Drogo. I you kind of look like. Oh my you God! That's like, like the greatest compliment I've ever received in my life. So, uh, do you remember? If I, he's I was, not that I, big. He's fucking humongous. Are you, you kidding? kidding? His, His pecs are bigger than my pillows like on my bed. Chest. Yeah, yeah. He's humongous. <laughs> but I remember I was telling someone they're like, oh, like, do you have you have you ever like laid the smack down on the internet? Have you ever like taken out? Vengeance upon someone who's whatever wronged you in the internet, and I was like, no, but I've thought about it, and I was like, every like six months or so. All right, sorry, I'm geeking out here, but you've seen Game of Thrones. Do you remember when he like he melts Khaleesi's brother's head? Yeah. With the, and then he like gets around the fire, and he's like, why? He just goes fucking crazy, and he's like, yeah. we will sail across the evil waters and fucking kill everybody, and I was yeah. like. I have one of those little like prancing scenes in my house, like imagining oh my God. delivering I can see you judgment upon too. someone, and then I'm like, ah, oh, it's too much fucking energy. I'm not gonna do it. <laughs> I can see you prancing around your house doing that. Yeah, prancing doesn't sound very manly, but yeah, I, <laughs> <laughs> very haughtily walking around my house with my tomahawks and archery tag kits. Amazing. Uh, you know, I, I have I, a tomahawk. Are you gonna scalp dude. somebody? All right, so SOG, S-O-G is the company that makes. Oh, I know SOG, the all black oh, ones. Yes. Yeah. So they have a tomahawk. They have cool tomahawks. It was used, uh, it was deployed at one point in Vietnam, for what reason, I have no idea. However. Chopping shit? Yes, but I didn't buy it for chopping, I bought it for throwing. And I built a knife throwing target when I was home in New York. Out of wood. Yes, out of pine, it's really soft. And it is so rewarding. Yeah, I've done that. To throw tomahawks into a wooden target, it's just, how many rotations can you get? Extremely gratifying. At about nine feet, one rotation, that's fine. Uh, but I was also I was also using knives, which are slightly different. But the, uh, where was I going with that? I'm not sure where I was Drogo. going. Oh, Drogo. Oh, yeah, Drogo. I do like Drogo. But uh, I need to work on my pecs. But the, uh, I was gonna tell you, you know how I've been anti, not anti, Yes, I have been anti. I've been anti games on iPhones for a long time. Like I don't, I've never had any games on my yeah. iPhone. So you don't even have Instagram on your iPhone. That's true. 
Uh, and I like I was Instagram, asking him and I need to use dinner. Instagram. I was like, dude, does anybody ever, ever tag you on Instagram? He's like, I don't even, what is that? I would, I should use Instagram. Honestly, all, all the, I, let me work on my English. What's preventing me from doing that is that I don't want to learn how to use another platform. So it's like, if someone sat me down there, it's like, look, you have here's, the iPhone. No, but hold on. Like, here's how you make photos. No, but you, you know, like Daria. All right, so Daria, uh, gave me a number of tips with different apps for making food photography look good. So if you search Daria Tim Ferriss food photography, I'm sure it comes up somewhere. A bunch of really cool apps like Snapseed, Snapseed. and a Camera number plus. Pro HDR, Instagram was number one. And I feel like I just need someone to sit me down like a parent. Dude, you, no need, you need Geek, geek Squad. <laughs> I hire Geek Squad. I'll hire him for you. From Best I'm gonna get you, to I'm teach gonna get me you how to use Best Instagram. Buy gift certificate. I just need to get, oh, that's like below Kevin's pay grade. The other Kevin. <laughs> but, yeah. I should be on Instagram. So, in any case. Jesus, now I'm all embarrassed and humiliated. No, I mean, no what, what I was gonna say is Geek Flow. Squad. Stop slapping me. <laughs> I you downloaded me. it. Uh, I'll bite you next. But the uh, Flow, have you ever played Flow? It's such a cool game. Yeah. It's fucking simple. It came simple. out like four years ago. I don't care about new. I'll play Pac-Man if I like it. Shinobi's a good game too, but instead I play Flow. But where did you get, did you get to, what matrix, what matrix, what matrix did you get to? Oh, I don't know, I haven't played that in years. <laughs> no, it's great. It's like, it's, well, like, it's like being for, like, for, dude, for you 60 year olds no, no, watching. No. It's like you being like, it's like you being like, dude, you remember this game called Shoots and Ladders? Or like Jenga? <laughs> Jenga's a good game. Yeah, it was out like 15 years ago. I know, I think I should revive Jenga. Maybe make a feature film out of it. Like Battleship. They made a movie out of Battleship. Battleship was fun. I played. Could Dario they make a movie out of Jack? <laughs> kicked your ass. No, you didn't. You got sick and almost threw up. Okay, then that's a good and question. Kicked your ass. All right. What was the question? So we're, we're getting off the. If you want to stop you can just the podcast stop right now, it right you can here. Stop. But, but I'm curious. Board games. Favorite yeah. board game. Favorite board game? Oh, I just played a new one that's really good. Heroes of Ismia. Heroes of Ismia. How do you spell Ismia? It's, it's not out yet. How do you spell Ismia? ISMIA. It's going to be out on Kickstarter. Our friend spent three plus years developing a game. He's our dungeon master. He's our dungeon master on, on D&D. He made like D&D. Wait, you guys play D&D? Yeah, pen and paper Wait, D&D. Wait, what? Are you serious? You play D&D? I was a humongous D&D Oh, dude, you should come play with us. For fucking years. Yeah, we play oh, all the time. Grey Elf. Oh, yeah. yeah <laughs> are you serious? You guys have like modules in the whole nine yards? Yeah, we got everything. We got a great dungeon master who builds like fucking elaborate shit and all kinds Holy of stuff. There's like swings moly. and shit. Like okay. My, so, my, yeah. so he created this new game that is like one session, one sit down, player versus player, D&D. And it's, role it's a role playing game. It's freaking awesome. It's good. Okay. It's really good. And it's going to be um, a Kickstarter project soon. Cool. Keep an eye out. Yeah. Heard it here first. All right, man. That's it. I don't know. I want to show you one more magic trick. Yeah, let's see one more magic okay, trick. Okay, here's my wedding ring. Oh, Watch this. Go. All right. I, I might screw this one up. So, uh, I'm gonna put the wedding ring on my finger, and what you do is you take you take the wedding ring and you basically like kind of move it down each finger. Mm. Listen to the bottom one. Mm. Did that look good? You look pretty good. No. Nice. <laughs> All right, everybody. like that was horrible. We're keeping it. <laughs> <laughs> See you next cool. time. All right, man.